Hey everyone, it's my pleasure to introduce this morning's session on gendering extremism. We are going to reverse the order slightly because we're waiting for one of our online presenters to join. So I'd like to welcome Hayley Tran and Matteo Vergani to the stage from Deakin University to present their paper on the role of misinformation and perceived male victimhood in shaping anti-government online behaviour among adult men. Thank you. Thank you for that, Vivian. And thank you, everyone, for coming back and being here with us still. Um, we won't talk your ears off because I am where it is the last day. Um, but to begin, let's start off with a bit of background. So why study misinformation, identity-based grievances and anti-government sentiment? <laughs> too loud. No, not too loud. <laughs> There is a lot of research showing that misinformation can lead to identity-based hate by distorting perceptions of outgroups, fueling biases, and intensifying polarizing attitudes. Hate, bias, and prejudice can pose significant challenges to social cohesion, escalating tensions, and possibly in the long run diminish trust in institutions. Um, and in particular, when outgroup grievances blame structural influences such as government and institutions directly, they can translate into anti-government or anti-democratic sentiments, posing a direct threat to um, democratic stability and governance. So by scientifically studying the relationships, um, and that is misinformation, identity-based grievances and anti-government sentiment. Um, we hope that policymakers and educators can be um, a step closer to developing targeted interventions that foster media literacy, mitigate negative impacts and promote informed civic engagement. So in this particular study, we are focusing on one specific identity-based grievance, and that is male victimhood, or at least a perceived sense of male victimhood. So how did this come about? Um, in a previous study um, that we did last year, we examined uh, Manosphere spaces, and one of them being YouTube channels, we looked at a bunch of, basically a bunch of channels that were dedicated to men's related issues. So, you know, typical things that young men would Google or, you know, look up for education or something. Um, and basically what we did was we looked for common narratives that were relating to basically grievances that were commonly discussed and shared amongst these channels. What we found was an overarching narrative that basically men nowadays are victims of feminism, government and society in general. So specifically, this is a very brief list of things because it does kind of go on forever. But for example, men's voices are now being silenced. So because of feminism or because of governments and societies that are now feminized, men's voices are being silenced and particularly because of all the other genders, other genders. Um, men are deprived of masculinity. It's negatively viewed um, to be your real man, whatever that is. Um, and men have lost their place and roles in society. So roles of protecting and um, uh, so many things, they're all lost. Um, there's the media as well, there's biases. Uh, the media is always portraying men uh, badly in the media, always blaming men for all the problems. 
um, the education system, boys are unfairly treated compared to girls. It's not a system that is geared towards um, helping boys thrive. Um, but, you know, generally, it's, there's just no future for men. There's just no hope, no future. Um, and so when we looked at some of these, these are four examples um, of YouTube video thumbnails. Um, but essentially, these, so, some of these have, I think, like six to 30 million views now. Um, and they're still there. But even if the titles and the images portray uh, sort of like education, educational content or things relating to how one can improve their chances of obtaining dates or romantic relationships, um, or even videos that portray, I guess, content that empower men, often the content itself is quite victimhood based. Um, so it, I guess in a way, I'm, even if you don't feel a sense of victimhood about your gender identity, you may after watching all this. So while there is nothing new about these qualitative findings that um, you know, we found last year, um, the thing is to measure this sense of victimhood quantitatively and in depth, there's currently no tool to do this with. Um, and the concept has not been studied. So we decided to develop and validate one. And, you know, I, I hear you say another scale, like we don't have a million of them. The answer is yes, another one. <laughs> so currently the ones that we do have in um, victimhood sort of um, theory and literature, we, we have ones that measure interpersonal victimhood and they're quite individual sort of level based and questions at face value are based on, you know, asking how you feel about something, say, in comparison to someone else, but it's all, it's, it's more aimed towards an individual self feeling sense. Whereas um, there is actually nothing that measures what people think or how people feel about this collective sense. Um, you know, and for some young men who may have this, in, may feel an individual sense of victimhood, by the time they get here, perhaps there's a collective sense. And so we wanted to develop something that measure that. Um, and the other thing is in, you know, gender studies um, and masculinity literature, there's actually lots of scales, lots. Um, precarious manhood, male supremacy scales, misogyny scales, sexism scales. There's actually a lot more of them than victimhood scales, but nothing that really combines both. Um, and the other thing is once we, you know, realised there was nothing to really measure this with, I did contact, um, you know, experts in these areas. And what they were saying is it, it, it's, probably, it's definitely something we need but we haven't done it because it's really complex. Um, victimhood, particularly in this context, this masculinity context, it's very complex and it's very hybrid um, and, and difficult to, to basically capture all the things. And, you know, we are well aware that we can't capture all the things, but at least if we capture some things that we felt were important, it's a good start. So the things that we wanted to capture that we also felt was quite important that emerged not only from our quantitative data, but qualitative data and interviews with people um, is five of these things. So the first thing is there's a heightened sense of criticism by others. Um, and so the items, so in, in for these types of things that we wanted to capture, we had several items for each. Um, and an example of an item is that is, People often criticise men for being real men nowadays. And so participants were asked to just rate on a seven-point scale like scale um, how they felt about that. 
ranging from, you know, disagree to very much agree. Um, and the other, the second one was need for recognition. Sometimes I wish people understood how difficult dating can be for men. Um, and in the manosphere, this narrative, it, it's not just about dating. Um, but it, it's, it's about a whole range of things. But there is a sense of injustice that really needs recognition by the public, by society, and often by women as well. Um, outsourcing blame and mainly structural blame. So because of feminism, there is no hope for the future of manhood. Mistrust of others or authority, societies and governments cannot be trusted to treat boys and men fairly. So these are some of the items that we have put together. Um, and all up, there are 20 items. And I can hear you all wondering, how did we analyze that? <laughs> and here we have Matteo to tell you. <laughs> Thank you, Ailey. Thank you. Uh, this research is really driven by Haley, so I'm, I'm privileged to be part of it. Um, as Ellie said, these are just examples. So we created a over-inclusive list of 20 items. Now, we wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about how we developed the scale and how we measured this concept, because I think this is a weakness of our field in general. We don't talk about how we measure things well enough. And the way in which we measure things drives the results that we get. So if we measure the same thing in different ways, we <laughs> likely we will get different findings and results. So it's really important to look at the detail. For example, we created this over-inclusive list of 20 items, as Haley said, driven by research, talking to experts. Well, we found that they were not actually measuring all the same thing. You can see the heat map. So the first column, yellowish, greenish, is the first latent uh, factor. Most items measure that, but many other items were measuring actually something else. So we did this analysis, we identified seven out of the 20 items that actually measure our latent construct. We conducted a uh, confirmatory factor analysis, and we confirmed empirically that we were actually measuring the same thing with the seven items. Um, I'm not showing you the items because we're still debating about whether we add another one or not. So we will publish it very soon. Uh, let's say we found seven items and you have seen examples to measure perceived male victimhood. Then we did a similar uh, process to measure misinformation. Now, misinformation is tricky because people are, I think there was a presentation on this on Monday, um, Tuesday, but no, 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 on Monday I'm talking about the uh, Australian Criminology Institute because they distinguished be between actively looking for uh, misinformation and passively being exposed to it. Well, actually we thought why don't we use a naturalistic measure, which doesn't exist, so we created it, showing people pairs of news outlets. So we started from the United States. So we collected a sample of people, males in the US. And that is an example of one item. We created 10, uh, showing one reliable news outlet and one unreliable. We created 10 pairs, uh, five more left-leaning and five more right-leaning. And we asked the people, which one do you trust more of the two? Now, to do this, we actually used um, NewsGuard data. So NewsGuard, maybe you don't know it, it's a agency based in the US. And for a living, they rate their journalists and they rate news outlets 
based on reliability and, well, uh, 10 criteria, but the most important is circulation of misinformation in the outlet. So on the one end of the scale, we put uh, outlets with 100% rating, so the most reliable ones. And on the other end, the least reliables or among the least reliables. So we did our factor analysis, blah, blah, blah. And yes, we found five items actually capturing trust in misinformation, which means that is how people react when they are exposed to misinformation. So they trust it. It's not about how much they are exposed to it, but how much they trust misinformation. So it's kind of a naturalistic scale of misinformation, which didn't exist before. And then to measure anti-government behavior, because we wanted to look at proxies of online behavior. So we showed, you can see a couple of um, um, video thumbnails with titles clearly presenting a anti-government content. So to measure a proxy of online behavior. So how much people would be likely to view the content? This is what we ask. Um, and then we, um, and then we um, ask a, a, a couple of questions about past online behavior, meaning if, they have voted in the past a, a politician with anti-transgender attitudes or if they made misogynistic jokes in the past. The idea is that in most quantitative research validating scales, past behavior is the best proxy of future behavior. So if you have done something in the past, you're very likely to do it in the future or more, more likely than others who have, done, have not done it. So. With this in mind, we conducted our mediation analysis. So as Haley explained at the beginning of the presentation, we wanted to understand how misinformation drives or has an effect on anti-government attitudes via a specific identity-based grievance, which is perceived male victimhood. Now we propose that this is the directionality of the path. Of course, this is a path analysis. So our data set is cross-sectional. So we can only have an hypothesis about the direction of the arrows, but this is what we hypothesize. So we propose basically that trusting misinformation can drive perceived male victimhood so can make people more likely to perceive this sense of victimhood, injustice, people, men, which in turn increases interest in anti-government uh, content. Why? Because most of the blame of this perceived male victimhood in this uh, manosphere is blamed upon society, government structures, and so on. Uh, so we collected our data with a sample of 531 uh, US males, 18 to 40 of age. Um, the first number suggests that for each change in the scale of comparative misinformation, so the more people trust misinformation, there is a 0 0.5 change in the perceived victimhood scale. So more trust in misinformation equal more trust in perceived male victimhood. And same thing, more trust in perceived male victimhood, more interest in anti-government videos. Then we looked at the effect of comparative misinformation trust on interest in anti-government videos. And basically we found that about half of the effect is mediated by perceived male victimhood. Which means, basically, how do we interpret it? Uh, men who think that they are a disadvantage, treated unfairly, um, 
are more likely to be driven towards anti-government content through the consumption of misinformation. Also, what, another way in which we um, uh, understand it is that potentially online misinformation in the manosphere for men contains a lot of content raising this perceived male victimhood and blaming structures and government, which in turn makes people more likely to be driven towards anti-government content online. So just to finish, um, we think, of course, this gives us you know, an indication of the need to uh, develop targeted intervention to address perceived male victimhood. Uh, of course, correlation does not imply causation, so we need more experimental research. This is our uh, hypothesis about you know, the, the directionality of the links between the variables. And look, we hope also that our new two validated scales, which we, we will be publishing soon, uh, perceive the male victimhood and the comparative trust, misinformation trust scale, can be useful for future research in this field you know, to do potentially more meta-analysis uh, on this topic. That's it, thanks. Thank you, Hayley and Matteo, for such a rich paper. It's my pleasure now to introduce our next presenters, Victoria Tate Signal and Dominique Lotharia. So Victoria will present both from the Defence Research and Development Canada, and they're going to be presenting on connecting hate groups, the role of traditionalist gender narratives, and we'll have their presentation now online. Oh, thank you so much. Let's just see if I can, can you hear me okay? Yeah. We'll just, um, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Bloom. We'll just see if I can get the screen sharing to work and we should be set. Mm -hmm. All right, share. And there we go now. Um, sorry, just one moment, let me see, there we go. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, great. Okay, so hello. Um, my name is Dr. Victoria Tate Signal, and I'm presenting on behalf of my co authors, Dr. Zerka Peter and Dr. Dominique Laferriere, uh, who's here in the audience joining us today. Um, and please allow me to speak for the three of us when I express our excitement about sharing this conversation with our fellow panelists and the audience. Uh, so thank you in advance for your consideration and your time. And thank you to the previous presenters for, uh, for uh, going first when I was having some connectivity issues. Um, what we do is we conduct research for Canada's Department of National Defense in a subsidiary organization called Defense Research and Development Canada. And we'd like to take this opportunity to share our research on gender and IMVE groups or ideologically motivated violent extremist groups, which I'll define shortly. And we'd welcome any feedback as we continue to refine this line of inquiry. Okay, so today we're going to share possible definitions for IMVE, the role of gender narratives and ethno-nationalist ideology, um, and then sort of a past and present review of through lines between nationalism, uh, gendered nationalism and IMVE. We'll move on to gender narratives across borders and then implications for both countering violent extremism, but also conclusions for future academic research. Uh, and really this presentation focuses on four core arguments. First, gender narratives shape violent extremist ideologies by reinforcing traditionalist norms around social interactions between men and women. Second, these traditionalist gender norms are used to attract and retain group members, many of whom feel alienated by modern North American gender relations and seek vindication in IMV groups calls to return to traditional gender relations that subjugate women, um, as our, our previous panelists pointed out so well. Third, several violent extremist groups share a belief that women's bodies ought to be under their control. And this is particularly true regarding the reproductive capacities of women and therefore their uh, ability to propagate a given race. 
Finally, these gendered narratives have resonance beyond IMVE believers' country of residence and therefore contribute to a transnational threat. This argument reflects the findings of an extensive literature review uh, into both academic literature, but also NGO findings and governmental reports. Okay, so this is uh, ideologically motivated violent extremism according to the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service. Um, and as you'll note from other presentations uh, through, throughout this conference, researchers really use a variety of terms to label groups and individuals we're talking about today. Um, we've moved forward with ideologically motivated violent extremism. Um, and again, according to the Canadian Security and Intelligence Service, you can see that as being comprised of four forms of violent activity, xenophobic violence, gender-driven violence, anti-authority violence, and other grievance-driven grievance driven ideologically motivated violence um i'm i am the concerns not only groups and persons that have participated in actual violence but also those that justify the use of violence against a perceived threatening out group so as we see here gender driven violence is sort of one of four categories of imve my colleagues and I have sort of reframed it this way for our research um, as having a through line to all of these forms of violence. Um, and these are of course ideal types. CSIS acknowledges as much, stating that these ideologies don't exist in silos and that individuals can move within and across these categories. Elsewhere, it's been highlighted that misogyny can serve as an online gateway to white supremacist organizations. And in this sense, gender narratives form a really important bridge across all of these narratives. Uh, we see this evident in the Canadian case and highlight what this means for the transnationalization of IMVE and the security of Canada and our allies. So, Traditionalist conceptions of gender relations, which is those that posit gendered binary roles for women and men, um, for example, maternalism and domesticity for women and protector or warrior roles for men, form a key linkage across all roles of IMVE. The importance of this uh, narrative can be foundational, as is the case with incels, or the group can simply leverage these narratives, as is the case with QAnon's use of beauty and parenting blogs to reach new female adherents. Here we will explore one such linkage between gender-driven and xenophobic violence. Individuals who espouse xenophob xenophobic forms of IMV tend to be connected through a shared vision of an ethnically homogenous nation, one which subjugates women and minority groups. Unlike conceptions of nationalism, whereupon communities are built upon a shared respect for the democratic institutions of the state, like the rule of law, um, ethno-nationalism or Volk nations uh, elsewhere hold that access to the rights of citizenship depend on one's ethnicity or genealogical history. National belonging is understood here as biological and therefore ostensibly immutable. Conceptions of citizenships based on ethnic or genealogical ancestry are referred to as right of blood or just sanguinous in political scientific literature rather than right of soil or jusoli, where citizens um, and oops, sorry, <laughs> where citizenship and belonging can be based on adherence to shared norms enshrined in an agreed upon law. Um, thus, the shared imagining of ethno-nationalism is the cornerstone of IMVE ideology. Okay, so where does gender come in, right? Uh, as Nuri Yuval Davis and others have demonstrated, nationalist projects are inexorably gendered. Nationalist ideologies create a set of norms and beliefs around gender identity and expression and support the gender division of labor and social reproduction within their communities. These traditional gender roles include women being caretakers of both the home and family, while men are seen as protectors and providers of resources. Uh, of course, endorsing traditional gender roles is not extreme in and of itself. However, it is important to note that within ethno-nationalist ideologies, women are seen as essential to creating citizens and then therefore perpetuating nations by giving birth to and raising children. Concomitantly, this encourages a specific form of protective masculinity amenable to perpetrating violence in service of the nation and the protection of the women and children therein. So we'll now turn to how these gendered nationalist myths inform both historical and present day IMVE and discourses. 
the relationship between gender and nationalism begs the question, how new are these ideologies uh, in modern IMVE groups? So gendered narratives are, of course, not unique to modern IMVE movements and have been historically used to weave together the belief systems of white supremacist organizations at a foundational level. These traditionalist gender narratives underpin constructs like the great replacement theory, where an internal cabal of elite are conspiring to eradicate the white race. These elite have variously been linked to racial minorities or marginalized persons, but at its core, uh, the conspiracy is founded on the perceived annihilation of the white race and or the co-optation of the state for the benefit of a racialized other. In its most extreme form, this can also be seen as white genocide conspiracy, which explicitly argues that plans are in motion to eradicate the white race. Similarly, the trope of men as warriors or protectors of white femininity has been a foundational myth in the propagation of ethnic violence. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, Kathleen Blee highlights that white supremacist organizations like the KKK have been used to have used traditionalist stereotypes about the vulnerability of white women to garner support. Uh, white women were portrayed variously as helpless victims, um, but largely of the sexual predation of black men. This powerful symbology would ultimately become the cornerstone of a narrative used to justify violence and criminality against black men, both historically and in the present day. The protection of white femininity as a rationale for white supremacist violence continues into modern day alt-right organizations. Um, Often referred to as the alt-right, these groups have reclaimed elements of earlier KKK discourse regarding the protection of white femininity and express a desire to protect their women and espouse uh, a nation against the menace of a racialized out groups. Groups like the Proud Boys have espoused ideology that, while not explicitly centered on violent extremism, maintains the hallmarks of hypermasculinity and ethno-nationalism. As a less conspicuous form of IMVE, these organizations present a public image that is more palatable to modern Western sensibilities while amplifying or introducing tenets of white nationalism as well as anti-Muslim and misogynistic rhetoric into mainstream conservative discourse. According to Lawrence and his co-authors, the racial outgroup that is targeted by the alt-right can take several forms such as the hypersexualized black or Muslim rapist or the enduring myth, myth of the sinister Jewish person that serves to corrupt white women, threaten their chastity, and dismantle traditional family structures through feminism and propaganda. He goes on to emphasize that the protection of women is at the core of both anti-Semitic and misogynistic groups' wider project of remasculinization. By celebrating a traditionalist narrative of gender roles where women are subordinate to men, Alt-right women's complicity and participation within these organizations buoys the idealized image of the white male warrior. And we can see a very clear through line of these gender narratives from the Confederate era to the present day. This further represents an example of how core mythology within the white supremacist movement can expand outside of its original framework, using gender narratives to entice new recruits and ignite racialized fears around the protection of the family. Okay. The alt-right's traditional and conservative gender narratives are further legitimated by mainstream political figures, including women. In both the US and Europe, female leaders have served to soften the IMVE-inspired substance of their campaign platforms, often adapting their image to appear approachable while emphasizing their role as mothers. For instance, Republican representatives Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene are members of the House Freedom Caucus, uh, the most radical element of the American Republican Party. Both have espoused support for QAnon conspiracy groups, while Marjorie Taylor Greene has made openly racist and anti-Semitic remarks on Facebook. In Italy, Georgia Maloney heads the far-right alliance Brothers of Italy, which won the Italian federal election in September of 2022. Brothers of Italy espouses an anti-LGBTQ agenda that is hostile to both immigration and the EU. In a frequently quoted speech, Maloney introduces herself saying, I'm Georgia, I'm a woman, I'm a mother, and I'm a Christian. Likewise, in France, politician Marine Le Pen gained notoriety as the head of the far-right party Ressemblement National while espousing anti-immigration and Islamophobic rhetoric. Having softened her image and retooled her campaign to focus on economic issues, she came close to capturing the French presidency in 2022. 
As these examples suggest, women have played a crucial role in mainstreaming alt-right sentiments by cloaking racist, Islamophobic, and far-right ideologies with their traditional femininity, thus using conservative gender narratives to their advantage. These messages frame progressive values around gender orientation, sexuality, and immigration as fundamental threats to the well-being of the nation and traditional family values therein. Uh, but of course, the weaponization of fear is not a new approach. The crucial element here is how it's been operationalized around gender. As exemplified by the great replacement theory described above, conspiracy theories have been effective at creating bridges between different IMVE variants, including anti-feminism, misogyny, and ethno-nationalism. IMVE groups are responsible for promoting civil instability by spreading misinformation and disinformation about democratic institutions, including electoral processes, rule of law, and evidence-based decision-making in public policy. In some instances, this interference has penetrated core democratic bodies, as was seen during the January 6 riots at the U.S. Capitol. Thus, IMVE influence extends beyond the initial, though, startling violence that they perpetrate, they threaten to use violence and fear-based propaganda to destabilize democracies. There is a danger that states and sub-state actors with similar goals are increasingly taking advantage of this destabilization to further their own nefarious goals at the expense of the liberal global order. For example, and uh, as you can see from the imagery I've included here, uh, the extremist Russian white nationalist uh, IMVs like the Russian imperial movements or RIM. Uh, it is therefore of the utmost importance that we understand how gender narratives play a key role in uniting IMVE groups by garnering sympathy from supporters, by serving as an artificial wedge to polarize voters, and by encouraging the recruitment of new members. So our research has several implications for work in countering violent extremism. To begin, gender targeted counter messaging merits further research. As we have demonstrated, gender narratives are interspersed throughout IMVE messaging, from conspiracy theories meant to goad hate crimes to anti-feminist propaganda designed to encourage women to stay at home and remain subservient to their husbands. As the global security community learned from Daesh, gender-targeted messaging is likely to be more effective than messaging that ignores gender. Often IMVE messaging hides in places and spaces that do not seem overtly threatening. For example, the Instagram pages of a so-called trad wife, or as some of our panelists, uh, fellow panelists have written elsewhere uh, in groups that uh, undergird pastel QAnon. Uh, so in naturopathic communities concerned with anti-government propaganda. <clears throat> Similarly, similarly, gender awareness training for intelligence and security personnel will remain an essential component of countering messaging designed to destabilize the state and its citizens. This is true for those personnel connected to security in the cyber domain, as well as those concerned with the more traditional spheres of security. Research suggests that gender narratives can act as a bridge across seemingly disparate organizations. This not only expands the resource base for IMVE groups, but it connects them across territorial borders. This uh, poses a threat to the egalitarian democracies, uh, which is sort of self-evident, but troublingly, it also poses a significant threat on the geopolitical stage. These narratives can empower state and sub-state actors to sow discord and encourage civil unrest on both a national and international level. To properly account for this threat, several lessons can be drawn from our presentation. Conceptualizations of gender and gendering are not just the purview of progressive academics. These, these concepts can be effectively used to sell and spread hate. IMVE organizations recognize this, if only intuitively, um, but it has become an important tool in the achievement of their aims. Moreover, state and sub-state actors on the periphery of IMVE mo movements may be able to use these narratives to further destabilize the democratic state. Therefore, more research is needed to better understand how gender is used by IMVE networks, both online and in the real world. Nationalism is gendered. If we accept this, then we must accept that white nationalism is also gendered. And this extends from the anti-Semitic dog whistles used by cons conspiracy groups, all the way to overt neo-Nazi organizations. The security sector needs more research to understand how these groups leverage gender narratives to the detriment of democratic beliefs and institutions. 
Finally, gendered social network analysis is a promising avenue for future research on how these groups operate across borders and use gender to reach uh, and retain IMVE adherence. This research is of the utmost importance as interstate conflict continues to escalate uh, national destabilization and that destabilization becomes a more desirable outcome for our adversaries. So if you have any further questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or any of my colleagues. I've just included my email address above uh, along with work cited in the presentation. Uh, if you um, have any sort of feedback on this line of inquiry or corrections that you'd rather discuss over email, um, that's how you can get us. Uh, and we'll be happy to make these slides available along with um, the notes from the presentation. So. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much for your time. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for the for the organizing committee for having us. My name is Jared DeMello, and I'm in the United States right now, but I'm actually moving to the University of Adelaide next year. Um, and with me is Dr. Mia Bloom um, from Georgia State University. We're so excited to be here today. We're going to be presenting a little bit of our exploratory research and a relatively new research area for us, looking at the intersection of anti-queerness and extremism in the United States and abroad. Um, so we already introduced our team, so I'm going to skip over that for brevity, um, but the obligatory statement from Funder, um, the research was supported in part by the Minerva Research Initiative through the U.S. Department of Defense, and any opinions, findings, or recommendations expressed in this presentation are those of the authors alone, and do not reflect the views of the Office of Naval Research, the Department of the Navy, or the U.S. Department of Defense. Thanks, Dell. <laughs> um, all righty, so let's get to the fun part. Um, so when we're looking at this context, just some background to help us sort of situate why we were interested in this. In late 2022, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security actually updated its terrorism advisory bulletin to include a whole slew of new um, potential victimized communities including the LGBTQ+, Jewish, and migrant communities. And this really was a game changer in the United States because this is where we saw the Department of Homeland Security move away from the radical Islam threats that they had previously posted. Specifically, the Office of Intelligence and Analysis really emphasized a lot of the anti-LGBTQ attacks that were happening around the world and specifically noted the attack in Slovakia for a gay bar um, and they said that there is a whole slew of actors in the United States, specifically far right actors, that were really encouraging their um, supporters and their sympathizers to engage in similar activity in the United States. However, um, despite this sort of emphasis um, from the government, within the academic literature, there is not a whole lot of research that's occurring sort of within this intersection. And more specifically, within the criminological space, there's almost nothing. And as a criminologist, that's very worrisome for me because a lot of the victimization research that's happening with um, victimization by terrorist actors is occurring in economics and political science. So as a part of this project, we really want to bring that into criminology. Um, and so even within this literature, moving even more specifically, LGBTQ victimization and terrorism is almost non-existent through Google search. So for some context, um, I think it's really important to look at the polit politicization of violence against the LGBTQ community in the United States and abroad. I'm going to talk about the United States, but Dr. Bloom will emphasize um, some of the abroad initiatives in her piece as well. So when we look at the LGBTQ population, it's important to know that it's increasingly being manipulated almost as a weapon by political entities in the United States, specifically the far right. The, this community is being persecuted, um, both in terms of limitations on human rights and just outright persecution by political parties across the United States. And so this map is actually showing some of the legislation that has occurred just in this year. And as of May 2023, which is the end of the legislative cycle for, more, for most states in the U.S., there are over 500 different bills that were introduced at the state level to either limit or completely abolish LGBTQ rights in those states, of which 70 were passed into law, um, and that's 70 too many, in my opinion. Now, the research actually shows that there is a correlation, a statistically significant correlation, between geographic location 
of these bills, as well as connectivity to increase far right activity, as well as far right political opinions. And actually the previous presenter did a really great job of setting this up. Um, tons of actors have made sort of international headlines, right? So she talked about Marjorie Taylor Greene's anti-women, anti-LGBTQ rhetoric, um, but also Ron DeSantis from Florida um, has made global headlines with his attack on Walt Disney World. Um, when Walt Disney actually stood up to him um, and Florida's Don't Say Gay bill. So ultimately, with all of the sort of political fighting against LGBTQ populations, something that we were really interested in is how does this political climate of hostility and hatred translate to um, engaging with extremism and extremist targeting of the LGBTQ community? So ultimately, um, we see these two sort of main buckets in the United States, right? Religious-based extremism and far-right extremism. And I think something that I've taken away from a lot of the presentations over the last couple of days is that we've all talked about how these buckets are kind of arbitrary and outdated. And we've talked about how we need to really think about these in a more holistic and modern way. But, and I think that our presentation is really sort of just adding to those conversations because what we found is these two groups that are seemingly very different are actually united through their use of anti-LGBTQ rhetoric and propaganda to further their own causes. Um, so I'm actually gonna hand the floor over to Dr. Bloom um, and she's gonna walk us through some case studies for these two groups. Thank you again. Um, I wish I could be with you guys in person. I really love Australia. So um, hopefully uh, Jared will extend invitations once he's in Adelaide. <laughs> Um, part of part of our interest in this came from a few sources. In 2017, while I was monitoring ISIS communications and this encrypted platform on Telegram, uh, we were able to prevent an attack uh, to a gay club in Canada. And it was a very funny conversation that I had with the RCMP, trying to explain how I knew about it and what they should look for. And and of course, it was. Uh, I guess, an anniversary of the Orlando attack at the Pulse nightclub. So uh, one of the things that really strikes me as interesting and worth further exploration is the fact that um, many of these groups that should have absolutely nothing in common seem to converge and agree on certain elements. So they, they don't like Jewish people, they don't like LGBT, and they don't even like Muslims that disagree with them. So it's very interesting that groups that should have nothing in common actually sometimes have quite a bit in common. So what we began was uh, on the lower right of your screen where it's like, let's learn critical race theory. And I'm sorry, it got cut off a little bit. This is actually from the QAnon encrypted platforms. Uh, I used the same methodology that I had used to monitor ISIS and sort of segued it over during the pand pandemic to look at the far right and right wing groups and groups like the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers. And so that opened up an additional um, research avenue. But for me, what was very interesting is that the ISIS, sorry, the QAnon encrypted platforms pivoted from talking about Stop the Steal to talking about critical race theory in around the summer of 2021. And so we really start to see this idea that QAnon needs to be present in, in school board meetings, they need to assert themselves in children's education. And so a lot of it, you see more information, more material that was on the uh, chat rooms, the QAnon sponsored chat rooms that was very anti-LGBT. And on the left-hand side of the screen, all that is is, a kid with his dad's at a gay pride parade. But this assumption that um, the LGBT community were quote unquote groomers. And so a lot of the um, uh, the dog whistles that you hear associated with the conspiracy theorists in part because they've been told, don't say Q, the same way that ISIS had been, to, been told previously in 2016, don't say ISIS, um, is that they will use certain buzzwords and they'll use things like groomers or we need to protect our children. Or sometimes they'll even go so far as to echo the 14 words, uh, which are the children that they need to protect. 
Um, if we can, uh, last point is one of the things that we started noticing because we're following the Telegram channels in a variety of languages, and it would maybe surprise people to know that there are QAnon channels in Hebrew, uh, given how anti-Semitic the QAnon conspiracy is, but we've also been following a lot in Russian. And so there's this intersection of uh, the war in Ukraine with the rise of conspiracy theories like QAnon and almost this back and forth um, self-pollinating between Republican talking points and talking points that we're seeing sort of within this Russian context. If we can go to the next slide. Um, and as, uh, as Dr. DeMello mentioned earlier, the, uh, the draft paper of this that I think is under review somewhere, it's one of several. Um, we look at the increasing anti-LGBT legislation around the world in places like Uganda and Poland to compare with what's going on in Russia. And we know, for example, from the, when Russia hosted the Olympics, that Vladimir Putin has signed into legislation making you know gay propaganda illegal, um, even making the rainbow illegal. And a lot of this is a reflection of the Russian Orthodox Church's position on LGBTQ. But within the in the broader context, uh, we have very limited recognition for queer rights globally. And this draws from the work of uh, our dear friend, Victor Assal, um, who's written on gay rights in, I guess, his 2021 book. Next slide, please. So interestingly enough, looking at the talking points for the disinformation war in Ukraine, what we saw was uh, some of this LGBT conversion centers were allegedly found in Ukraine and that in fact, there was even one going so far as uh, arguing that um, promoting LGBT rights in the West was a way of undermining Russian manliness and their ability to fight. But it's really hard when you're looking at it from the outside, it's hard to disaggregate like where are all these things connected? There's no connection between Ukraine, Russia, LGBT, unless you're looking through the prism of these conspiracy theorists that are connecting all three. If you could go to the next slide, please. And of course, uh, this argument about the connection between LGBT and Satanism. So this idea of uh, queer rights is, a, is really a cover for worshiping the devil or Satan. And in the US, it's also a cover for Marxism. So all of these things get all mushed together. But we start to see the same talking points that um, Republicans are saying, you know, for the cameras about protecting the children from groomers and from drug queen story hour. We see this playing out in the Russian language telegram channels that are very much um, supporting QAnon and conspiracy theories. Next slide, please. Uh, th this one was our favorite. We we found that uh, the, the Russians have designed a mosquito repellent because they say that NATO has created mosquitoes that if they bite you, you'll become gay. So that they've created the these kinds of uh, bioweapons. And of course, this, this is, goes hand in hand with the argument that uh, COVID-19 was created in Ukrainian labs, Chinese labs. And so they're actually selling a Russian uh, mosquito repellent designed specifically to protect you from those NATO mosquitoes that'll make you gay. Next slide, please. <laughs> When we look at uh, some of the data that's been collected by Apple in Ireland about drivers for the far right, the mustard yellow color is anti-LGBT. And this is just to show you sort of um, like in um, representation, graphic representation, that when Dr. DeMello says that we're seeing an uptick, we're not just seeing an uptick within the United States, we're seeing it globally, but here's a way to map it from ACLED's data, looking at what the far right is being motivated and who the far right is being motivated against. Next slide, please. 
And here's where, again, the convergence with ISIS. Now, according to ISIS, there is argumentation that anti-LGBT, anti-homosexuality comes from the Quran, that they can they can point to certain Quranic verses that are talk about, you know, men with men and how it is an affront to God. But the fact remains is that these verses are also open to some interpretation and that most of the anti-LGBT is not so much from the Quran, but much later in terms of what the societal conventions are. Anyone who's lived in the Middle East knows perfectly well that there is a lot of male familiarity because marriage is delayed until their 30s and, and men have a tendency to keep each other company, but they just don't call it gay. Within <laughs> ISIS, when it was ruling its uh, territorial caliphate, they made a um, drama out of taking gay people to tall buildings and throwing them off the tallest building. And in fact, this was reiterated in Inspire and in Dabik, their, their written propaganda. So I, I start, I end where I started, which is a lot of what we've seen has been very much within the jihadi literature being very homophobic and very anti-LGBT, but we've also seen it from the far right and from QAnon. And so it's interesting where we have this convergence. Um, jihadist groups have adopted more extreme positions and they justify killing people, citing this uh, Islamic law to justify brutality, violence, and the killing of civilians. Because again, there's many, many Quranic surahs that say you're not supposed to kill Muslims and you're not supposed to kill civilians. So again, this is not to say that this is an Islamic thing. This is a bastardization of Islam in as much as it's also a bastardization of most of the other monotheistic faiths. Next slide. So as far as uh, future work, uh, this article is under review. Uh, we'll be presenting an updated version of this at ASC in Philadelphia in November. Uh, we're looking at different kinds of uh, methods in terms of machine learning and NLP to look at the online forums as well as using surveys and interviews. We've been applying to funding both in the US and in Australia. I will tell you that we've done this research, but we haven't been able to find a funding agency all that interested. <laughs> um, it has been a bit of a challenge and it's only through the fact that Jared is incredibly entrepreneurial that we were able to get as much done as we did. So um, we want to segue this work into some sort of tool. Well, let's go back one more. We want to segue the tool into a tool that will be useful for law enforcement and counterterrorism, because I think a lot of misunderstanding of the LGBT community is also within law enforcement and uh, counterterrorism communities. So they don't know how to address these crimes against the community. They also have a discomfort engaging with the community and the communities tend to be a little bit suspicious of law enforcement as well. Now we can go to the last slide. And yeah. for further uh, information, Dr. DeMello is there. He's got his electronic card and uh, thank you again uh, my email is wrong, but that's okay. It's mbloom3 at GSU, and everything else is correct. All right. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you.